So today I'm going to be talking to you about sort of a quick, uh, quick start guide to management. And this is going to be most immediately useful to folks who are thinking about getting into management, who have just had management thrust upon them. Like, oh, hey, you'll be line managing people now. Or folks who are in the unfortunate position where career progression is going to kind of be linked to management, where you're looking into the future and you say, well, if I want to keep getting more senior, I have to manage people. This is probably going to be really useful for you. Maybe also useful for folks who've recently started managing. If you've managed people for a long time, you may have some arguments about this. I would love to fight you politely on the internet. <laughs> or I'd love to chat afterwards. Uh, to give you a little bit of background about myself, my name is Jessica Rose, and I'm a technical manager over at FutureLearn. But I've been managing people in the technology industry and in education for looking around um, possibly longer than a couple of you have been alive. Um, <laughs> I see some young ones. Um, and today we're going to be looking at a very, very specific slice of management. We're going to be looking uniquely at managing individual people and managing people within teams. We're not going to be looking at a lot of other different important aspects of management. I'm so sorry that just due to the length that we have here today, we're not going to be talking about dealing with upper management. We're going to completely skip over office politics like it doesn't exist. We're not going to be talking about managing around product. We're not going to be talking about program management. We're just going to like strip this down to the MVP of management, which is just sort of the care and feeding of technologists that you're being charged with. When I tested this out last night and did a trial run, uh, this talk clocked in at about an hour and a half. I am not going to subject you all to an hour and a half. Uh, so just to be aware that this has been cut really, really firmly down. Uh, if you do want to have a longer conversation about this, again, I would love to argue politely or chat nicely on the internet to anybody who's interested. Uh, before we get started, I just want to do a quick and dirty sampling to take a look and sort of get an example of why management might be really important. And asking people to raise their hands for this is a little politically challenging. If I say, oh, who's had a terrible manager? If you're here with a work group, don't, don't, don't raise your hands. <laughs> if you're here with a manager or if you're here with your, you don't want to raise your hand. Even if it's somebody way back in the day, they'll be like, oh my god, is that me? And managers, hopefully it's not you. But instead of that, can you just give me a gently pained expression? Can you look a little bit unhappy? If you've ever had a terrible manager, who here has ever had a manager where it really negatively impacted your experience? Oh, wow. I was like, don't raise your hands. And everybody's like, no, 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 I'm raising my hand. <laughs> Who here's had a manager that made you think about leaving your job or caused you to leave? Damn. <laughs> Got like two hands going up in spaces. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to address is management and ethics. And this is something I'm really interested about and something I'd love for the industry to have a longer conversation about. As a manager, your work directly impacts not just the working lives, but the holistic lives of the people you're charged with taking care of. You spend, in, in my humble opinion, far too long at work. You've got eight hours a day if we're, if we're lying. Crunch time happens, overtime happens. In a beautiful world, I'd love to see everybody working no more than five or six hours a day. Uh, but until this glorious revolution, seven, eight plus hours a day, that is hundreds upon hundreds, upon thousands of hours of your life. Crappy jobs and crappy management can massively impact that working time, which can massively impact your life, your ability to be happy, your ability to sleep, your ability to maintain your health and relationships. As a manager, we have a massive amount of responsibility for this, which we really rarely address. And I think as an industry, we really rarely appropriately wait. How nice and scary. As a manager, you could completely destroy people's lives. But you won't, right? <laughs> Uh, for folks watching on the video, uh, the audience isn't mic'd, so of course they all went, no. There were no inappropriate chuckles, no sort of creepy, yeah, I'll be a supervillain laughs. Everybody was just like, no, no, I'd love to be a, a good manager. But we're also going to take a look at some of the trade-offs. As a manager, you've got the ability to do bigger things. A team, notwithstanding the add another developer rule, a team can get more done. 
you can deliver bigger projects. You can deliver whole products. Depending on where you are in the leadership chain, you can make huge, big, scary things happen. But the trade-off is that you're probably hands down on that less. Bigger things are happening, but you don't get that very, very tactile satisfaction of doing the thing right now. We've touched on this already, but like, as a manager, you've got a huge responsibility for and a huge impact on the lives of your reports and your teams. But at the same time, once you get that responsibility, you've got a whole new set of responsibilities that go with it. Maintaining professional distance with your reports, acting appropriate, whether or not you want to, and whether or not you'd like to think of yourself as, you're a de facto role model. Oh, I can say this, so-and-so laughs at these jokes all the time, is the kind of thing that you're gonna to wanna to be thinking about. Whether or not you want to, you're sort of the, yeah, person responsible for setting the tone. You get to take responsibility for lots of things, isn't that? Nobody, nobody looks like that's a great thing. Not only do you get to take responsibility for things, you also get to make sure, if you're a good manager, that you're consistently sharing credit. When stuff goes wrong, you've got to take responsibility and say, oh wow, this didn't get delivered, this didn't work, this wasn't good. And you don't have to take all the credit, you're not a martyr. But when great things happen, you all have to be really, really careful. You say, well, thank you, but so-and-so did this, and the team pulled this through. You get to just suck up all the miserable parts and share all the great parts. You're going to be doing something brand new. Management's so different. It's an entirely new set of skills. It's a new set of working. It's a new way of working. But you might hate it, which is completely fine. Nobody's going to make you... Mm, folks might make you be a manager, but nobody can make you stay a manager. If you try it out and you really give it a great shot, if this doesn't work for you, you can always go back to being an individual contributor. Everything's going to be fine. So we've got some, some pros and cons. I'm going to touch really briefly on management style. Uh, those of you who may have met me before or those of you who are in the audience, you might be shocked to learn that I am the happiest kindergarten teacher of a manager. I'll give it to you like, oh, wow, one-to-ones are just... I've usually got sweets, there's lots of chirpiness. It's, it's who's German? Yeah, it's terrible, it's the worst. <laughs> uh, but you've got to develop your own management style, and it's going to be very, very different depending on who you are. You're going to want to stick within some sort of shared ethical constraints, but act in the way that works best for you. Once we've said that, you do have to tailor that for your individual needs of your reports. If I come into a one-to-one -one and say, wow, hi, how's it going, how fantastic are you? To someone who's a little bit more stoic and a little bit more reserved, I'm not giving them the management they need. I'm not giving them the relationship they need. And that sounds like a really exhausting half hour of chat. When you're looking to sort of adjust your management style for your reports, make sure that you're willing to move past your comfort zone. Make sure that you're meeting their tone and make sure that you're meeting your needs where it's appropriate. You're going to be changing yourself a little bit, and it feels weird, and you're going to be compromising a lot. The one thing I would beg you to do is be willing to compromise on the things that you can. Compromise on your style. Compromise on your tone. Please don't compromise your ethics. When you see something as a manager that isn't appropriate, that isn't right, that's harassment, that's abuse, I'd love to tell you all that if you become managers, you're going to go into an industry where you never see harassment and there's no discrimination, and ev but you're adults and I, I don't much feel like lying to you on a Saturday. As a manager, you're going to see things and you're going to encounter things that are completely inappropriate and don't fit your, your ethics. Make sure that you're compromising your style and not compromising your ethical standing. Cool, let's get quickly into the practical things. These are the things you're probably almost definitely going to need to do as a manager. You're going to need to have one-on-ones with your reports. If you're managing people in the same space, ideally a physical meeting where you sit down regularly. And how regularly really depends on you and really depends on your report's needs. This could be bi-weekly, this could be once a sprint, um, this could be once a month. I'm going to go ahead and put out there that you, as a manager, need to have regular one-to-one -one reports, one-to-ones with your reports as a call, as a meeting, 
And I've got this asterisk here, because every time I put forth an absolute where I say, everyone here who's doing this thing needs to do one-to-ones, I have somebody come up in the Q&A, or I have somebody come up afterwards to be like, I've got a very special edge case. I've not yet encountered a very special edge case where you don't need to have one-to-ones with your reports, but I've totally covered myself by having that tiny star. If you do have a magical edge case where you don't have to have one-to-ones with your reports, please come and see me after class because I'd like to skeptically, well, the, politely question what, what you're doing. And if you're managing people, like this seems very weird. <laughs> uh, you're going to want to meet regularly with your reports, calls in person. Some folks do them in Slack. Try and meet the way people, the way people like best to communicate. And you're going to do this for a lot of reasons. You're going to celebrate with them. You're going to keep track of what they're doing and make sure they're feeling their own success. Say, wow, you know what? Tell me about what you've done this week. Uh, something I really like to ask in one-to-ones is, please tell me the last thing you were really proud of. And this is fantastic because folks not only get to say, oh, wow, I did this, I contributed that. But if folks are taking a little bit of time or they're really struggling to think of the last thing they were proud of, it's probably a great early warning sign that things aren't super great somewhere. You've also got the opportunity to identify issues early. I think everybody who's been in any kind of work long enough has been in a situation where stuff wasn't great. And it would have been fantastic for someone to come along, identify what was wrong, and help fix it. As a manager, your ability to identify what's wrong and fix it can really, really be tied to coming in, establishing a relationship, and meeting with your reports often. It also lets you build your relationships. If I walked up to one of you right now and said, oh, hi, tell me about everything that's going wrong in your job. That's terrifying and that's strange. There's no trust. There's not a relationship. There's no sort of mutual understanding that the information is going to be used and used well. Having these one-to-ones lets you build a relationship and build a rapport and build that trust that's going to be so important. And you also get a really fun opportunity to offer support and advice. As a manager, in a perfect world, and I hope you as managers, you're not telling people what to do. You're managing adults, and oftentimes you're managing brilliant adults who know what they need to do. You're offering support and guidance and helping them with shared goals. Sometimes you're going to be able to offer a little bit of advice, but a lot of times as a manager, you're just acting to facilitate what people need. As a manager, you're going to be called upon often to deal with feedback, either giving it to your reports directly or going out into the larger company or going out and talking to clients and bringing that feedback back to them. I'd really love for everybody to be giving their uh, reports feedback early and often. Uh, oh, don't raise your hands, of course, but look gently annoyed. Uh, if you've ever been in a situation where you get feedback, but you get feedback all at once in your annual review and it's a terrible surprise and you can't really do anything with it. <laughs> Sorry, there are a couple people raising their hands and a couple people looking appropriately pained. This should never happen. The one-to-ones aren't just so they can check in with you. You're giving people say, hey, wow, I went out and chatted to your delivery manager. I was talking to your designers. Here's what they mentioned. Here's what folks mentioned about the last sprint. I don't think I can threaten you all, um, but if any of you become managers where you're criticizing your reports in a public setting, where you're yelling at folks where other people can hear you, I will be excruciatingly disappointed in you. Uh, the golden rule here is that you should be praising your reports very publicly. When something goes great, that's a shared celebration. When something goes wrong, doing that in a shared context is just a weird exercise in humiliation. It's never necessary. You never need to do it. Yeah, it makes Santa cry. There's just so many reasons not to do this. Make sure that the feedback's not just coming from you. Make sure that your boss and your boss's boss and your boss's boss and folks who work below them in the food chain are all giving feedback. Some of the most fantastic feedback I've ever gotten from a report came from the office manager, the person who helps make sure the physical space keeps running where they say, wow, that person you're managing is always extremely rude and sometimes swears at me when it's time to get stuff done. Where it's like, oh, oh that's, that's extremely good feedback. I'm going to make a note and address this in private. Keep feedback.
feedback focused and actionable. It can be really tempting to give bad feedback when you get bad feedback. If somebody comes to you and says, oh, wow, you know, that thing Jamie's doing is it's just really weird. You can't just go to Jamie and be like, hey, you're doing this thing and people think it's really, that's terrifying. That's terrible feedback. Before you get feedback to pass on, make sure you know what it is. When you say, when you say this thing with Jamie is really weird, what do you mean? I don't manage anyone named Jamie, by the way. Everything's fine. Uh, what do you mean? What kind of behavior is this? Is? Can you think of an example? Make sure that the feedback you're bringing people is meaningful. And make feedback available in different forms. It can be really tempting to get positive feedback, go to someone and say, oh, wow, everyone was delighted with this. Good job. But unless you write that down somewhere, that's gone forever as soon as you've said it. While you're recording it, I want you to be recording this in a living document for yourself as well. This is a really fantastic way to work out patterns. You say, wow, do you know what? Looking back at all these notes and looking back at this feedback I've gone to solicit, it looks like Janice has been doing a lot and getting a lot done, but not really getting the recognition she deserves. Or it looks like Zoe is having a lot of conflicts with coworkers across the company. This is something to really take a look at. Um, human memory is massively fallible. We're, yeah, our brains are wonderful and terrible. You'd love to think you're gonna remember this in a week, in two weeks, in a month, but unless you keep a living document, you're probably not gonna do it. Goal setting, fantastic. Since all of you love to raise your hands, who's left a job because you weren't learning anything? <laughs> this has gotta be so frustrating for folks watching the video. This is about uh, half of all of the people you can't see. If you're managing enough folks, or even if you're managing a small team, even if you're managing a few reports, folks will absolutely leave their technology jobs if they're not learning. This is an incredible cost. As a manager, hiring and becoming a hiring manager is gonna eat up a lot of your time if you're involved in that. It is so much easier and so much more humane and the right thing to do to focus on retention. Here, make sure that you're setting goals that really emphasize learning wherever you can. Setting goals with your reports, you want to make sure that you're setting a mix of goals and that you're setting it collaboratively. You can't just go to another adult and say, hi, here are your goals for the quarter, have a good day. I mean, you can do that exactly once. Um, and then after you don't have a team anymore, you're kind of on your own. You've got three different types of goals, I think. You've got the goals that come down from the company, your three-letter acronyms, your KPIs, your OKRs, your other three-letter things. You don't really have a choice there. You'd be like, hey, exciting. Here are the things we have to do. All right, that's fair. And then you've got shared goals with the team. And these are the things you have to do, but also a mix of things that the team collectively wants to do, or most of the team wants to do, and then individual needs. And then the most exciting for your reports are getting to set those individual goals. Talking to your reports and saying, what do you want to be doing? If you want to be a jerk, do this with a straight face and be like, where do you see yourself in five years? But talking to your reports about what do you want to learn? What do you want to stretch? What do you want to do more? What would you like to do if it wasn't so scary? What are your big goals? What are your big dreams? It's terribly earnest, isn't it? Once you get these goals down, once you build them together, put them somewhere trackable. The same way feedback doesn't exist if you don't write it down, Goals don't exist if you don't track them week to week. I am a big fan of shared Trello boards. Everyone loves a checklist. No one conv convinced me that's not true. Um, and that being able to look back on your goals, the things you've accomplished, can be incredibly valuable for reports. Uh, for those of you in the audience or those of you watching, even if your manager isn't doing this with you, I would love to see folks doing this themselves. Track what you've done, track what you've learned, and what's really satisfying is when, when you move something into the done column and it feels big, immediately go and put that on your CV. You're learning really valuable things, but unless you're tracking them, you're gonna be years down the line trying to remember what you did. Encourage your reports as they set goals to see them as stepping stones. There's a lot of really great theory and a lot of really great study on what good goals are. Smart goals are something that would be really, really good to look up in your own time or chat to me about this afterwards. But encourage your reports to set small, actionable goals 
that lead to the big thing they want to do and the big thing they care about. And the big secret here is that what your reports might want to do might have nothing to do with your company. It might have nothing to do with your product, and it might have nothing to do with you. As a manager, this is just the way things are going to be. You can't make people stay. And if you could, it would be incredibly creepy. <laughs> I love how somebody at the back has just like the perfect evil laugh to be like, Mwah, I bet I can. <laughs> I'd love for managers and future managers to view their reports moving on as sort of graduating out. If folks are moving on to something that fits them well, if they're moving on in a healthy way, if they're not rage quitting, folks leaving you is actually really positive. You can't stop them from it. You can create an environment where they don't have to quit, or they don't feel forced out, or they can grow for as long as they can. But make your peace with people having goals that are bigger than you. Ah, oh, reviews, the dreaded annual review, or biannual review, which is the worst word ever, because it can mean once every other year or twice a year. The same caveat as your one-to-ones. I'm going to say that if you're managing, you need to have rev regular reviews for your reports. And I have had people come incredibly say, ah, 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 Jess, because we were on a first-name basis, I guess. So, hey, I don't have one-to-one -one reviews with my reports because we, we work in this weird thing in government and it happens a different way, or we have a flat hierarchy and we all review ourselves and each other and it's magic. Almost all of you, as managers, will have to have regular reports. And what's really challenging is that not all of us have the opportunity to impact this part. In a perfect world, or in a just and reasonable workplace, a review process should directly impact your, your future, your trajectory, your goals. It should impact your ability to move into the, another role. It should impact your promotion. It should impact your pay. That's not always the case, and that's fine. It's just not a great review process. If you want to be, if you want to be telling yourself that you're leading as meritous a uh, team as possible, try and make sure that these reviews have actual impact on what people are doing. Uh, there's some fantastic work out on debiasing reviews. And there's some fantastic um, work out on career progression frameworks, on tying reviews to salary. Um, one thing I always like to remind people is, if you're a manager and you don't know what your reports are getting paid, you are living in a very, very dangerous environment. Almost definitely someone's being underpaid. And as soon as they discover it, and I hope they discover it soon, they're very reasonably going to move on. As a manager, managing to advocate for your team and making sure they're getting what they deserve in a good way is the best thing you can do for reports. In a review system, none of this should be a surprise. You're all future managers. You're all managers now. You've been having regular one-to-ones with your reports, right? <laughs> that was a very enthusiastic, yeah, not a half-hearted, sarcastic shake of the head. You've been having regular one-to-ones with your reports, and you've been honest, and you've been giving them good feedback. You shouldn't come to a situation where you've been saying, everything's fine, good job, everything's fine, good job, everything's fine, good job. Welcome to your review. You're not getting a raise, and you're back on, on probation. That should never be the case. A review should be a synthesis of what's happened over the past year and the feedback you've been passing back all along. If you've gotten to the point in a review where somebody's completely surprised by something, you've, oh, I'm going to cut out the probably, you've screwed up as a manager, or they've done something really weird in the last week. As a manager, it's not always positive. You don't get to go, wow, great job, oh, I really love this, here's some positive feedback, all the time. Workplaces are full of people, and people suck a lot of the time. As a manager, you're going to have to have some difficult conversations, and you're going to have some, dif have some difficult conversations that don't leave you feeling good at the end of the day. Before we touch on these a little bit, the one thing I should say is never, ever avoid addressing harassment, abuse, or discrimination in your teams. Uh, this is something that you do need to investigate, you do need to unpick, but immediately what you're going to want to do is remove people from the situation. I'm not saying fire them, I'm not saying fire them out of a cannon, 
but just make sure that where those conflicts are happening, <laughs> sorry, where those conflicts are happening, that you're able to step in immediately and uh, provide oversight, provide extra support, and just make sure that folks aren't being negatively impacted. When there is a difficult conversation to have, when there is negative feedback, make sure you're balancing the timeliness of it with accuracy of information. If you've got somebody above you, if you've got a hyperactive West Coast, San Francisco, Silicon Valley CTO who comes in every other day with like, oh, hey, top of my mind feedback. So and so is doing terrible. We got to get rid of them. Oh, we got to start over. And you know that 24 hours are going to come by and they're going to be like, wow, completely different. We need a cotton candy machine for the office and everything. If you've got folks who are going to change their mind on feedback quite often, that's a really good opportunity to sit and wait on something just for a little while, just to make sure they're not going to change their minds and everything that you're communicating is meaningful. You're not going to want to completely shield your reports from that. If you're getting contradictory, high conflict feedback on someone, completely sheltering your team and completely sheltering your reports don't help them. They're going to be exposed to that eventually. Let people know, well, you know, I've been getting a lot of feedback from the hypothetical CTO, um, and it's been very mixed. This isn't really going to impact, like this doesn't necessarily speak to your ability because this is happening across the company, but I wanted you to be aware of sort of the nature of the feedback that's coming down. When you are getting really, really negative feedback or you're seeing patterns arise from feedback that are discriminatory, constitute harassment or abusive, it is absolutely your job to push back on it. Um, keeping good records, documenting things clearly, letting folks know when you see patterns, not necessarily to your reports, oh, this is completely unfair, you're totally getting screwed over, I would quit tomorrow, is a weird, weird difficult conversation to have. But addressing that higher up and saying, I've noticed a pattern in these promotions, I'd like to discuss these with you because I don't think these reports are getting accurate feedback. I don't think they're getting what they deserve. I've saved the best for last. I want to talk to you about managing people in toxic workplaces or toxic environments. <laughs> I'm, I'm not just laughing myself. You, you, on, the cam on the video, you can't hear the audience. We, we had a moment. It, it's over now. It's, it's not over. So, hi, you're in a toxic workplace. Good for you. That's probably really exciting day to day. And you're managing people in a toxic workplace. Oh, how whatever fun without the fun is. How dynamic. <laughs> I, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to accurately say that without swearing. The one thing I would say is like, I'm sure you're all lovely people. You're all, you all want to be great managers. If you're managing people in a toxic workplace, you want to be a buffer. You don't want to hide anything from them. You don't want to, to convince them that everything's fine. But you want to make sure that they're not getting screamed at. You want to make sure that they're not getting the brunt of the abuse. Don't hide things from them. Don't lie to people. But also at the same time, you can't bleed for your team. If you're in a toxic workplace, the chances of you being able to fix this by yourself are relatively small. Everything's terrible. Yay. <laughs> I love speaking in Germany. Y'all like laugh at the best things. <laughs> and this gets really difficult because as a manager, your ability to say like, wow, all of this is messed up. Y'all should quit your jobs and work someplace else is tempting, right? But you often have contractual or fiduciary duties or, or like direct contact li contract lines that say you can't do that. And that's fine. But you do want to make sure, whether or not you're in a toxic workplace or a toxic environment, make sure that your reports have solid external report, uh, supports. Make sure that folks have friends in the industry. Make sure they have an external mentor. Make sure they have someone else to talk to. Whether or not you're in a toxic workplace, the nature of work means that eventually, as a manager, you're going to have to ask someone to do something that's not directly in their best interest. Maybe you want them to stay on your team, where really, it's that time in their career where making a big jump, going on to that next role might be the best thing for them. 
Maybe you want them to work overtime, and no one wants to work overtime because who would want to work overtime? The nature of work, uh, the nature of work every place I've been. Ooh, maybe this is a capitalism thing. <laughs> Sorry, I just. Hmm. Means that you're sometimes going to ask people to do things that are not in their best interest. Make sure that they have solid external support, especially in a toxic environment. This gives you a very, very. This gives me a cheat. If stuff's going wrong, if stuff's gone toxic, or if I'm asking to do something that's not in their best interest, I ask my reports very early on in our management relationship. Say, hey, do you have someone you could come to, someone who's not working in the company, who works in the industry, who gives you good advice? If they say yes, I say fantastic. If they say no, I say okay. Well, here's a bunch of people who could. I could introduce you to any of them, and I will never ask you what they what what you say to them. Just make sure that people have. Someone they can speak to, and in a perfect world, don't ask them who it is. That's not your business. But this gives you a great cheat. If stuff's all gone wrong around you, you've got a very, very sort of subtle way of saying, "Oh, so this is happening." I'd strongly recommend you go and chat to so and so. You should get their advice on whether or not this is a good thing for you. Which is kind of tapping in an adult. You can't say this is all terrible and toxic. Quit your job. Run now. But you can say. You should go talk to a third party who has your best interests at heart, who isn't pulling a paycheck here. Make sure that your team has the tools to leave a toxic setting if they want to. And some of these can be really, really soft touch.、Um, everybody uses LinkedIn because it's incredibly useful, right? Oh, this is very earnest. That's a very earnest yes. Do you work at LinkedIn?、Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry.、Uh, writing LinkedIn recommendations for people can be hugely anxiety-inducing. If you're a manager and you write someone a recommendation and don't mention it to them, that can be a weird red flag to be like, "Oh, am I getting fired?" Have a chat to someone first and say, "Oh, hey, every year or so I try and write people recommendations. I'm going to be writing you one. Everything's fine." What could I? What, what would you specifically like me to mention? I'll start a shared doc. Go ahead and put in any bullet points you think I've missed, and I'll write you a recommendation. Making sure that people know that they can turn to external support, making sure that you've given them sort of self-serve tools to get out, like recommendations, and making sure they're getting time where possible to get to industry events where they can get other jobs,、uh, can be really useful when you can't say run. And we've talked a lot about what you can do for your reports. I'd also like to touch on what you can do for you as a manager. So we're going to touch very, very briefly on getting support as a manager, and then I'm going to see if I've got any questions I can answer for you.、Um, if there are questions about the toxic workplace stuff, we'll, we'll, we'll cut the video feed for this. Folks watching at home, no one asked about a toxic workplace. The first thing you can do is set a healthy example for your team. If you're working long hours, if you're sending emails at midnight, if you're making calls on the weekend. You're telling your team and you're telling your reports that this is appropriate. This is how we work, and whether or not you mean to, you're telling them that this is what I expect of you. When you set really healthy examples, it makes your life better, but also makes their lives better. If you must, must, must send an email out of hours, all the major email server services you, you use Gmail, you use Outlook, all of them let you add a feature to send this Monday at 10 a.m. If you have to do emails out of hours. Go ahead and make sure they get sent during hours. If you're wonderful and loving and giving and sharing, you say, "Wow, I want to make sure my team takes good care of themselves. I want to make sure they have a good work-life balance." But I'll work myself to death. Don't do that. That's stupid. <laughs> But if you take care of yourself, you're going to be setting a good example for them, and you're going to have more time and more energy and more empathy to take care of yourself, take care of your reports, and take care of your team. No, seriously, go and do stuff that is not work. Go and do like. I don't really get tabletop gaming. Like it's it's just video games with pieces to lose. But if that's your thing, go do that. Go read. Go running. Have a life that isn't work and model that kind of kind of behavior for your reports. The same way I want all of your reports to have an external mentor they can get good unbiased advice from. 
I'd love to have all managers have someone they can go get good, unbiased advice from. Make sure that when you do have to rant, you're never using people's names, you're never, ever making life more difficult for them, and that you have a private, offline, confidential space to vent. Again, it's not a threat, but if I ever see any of you bitching about reports or bitching about your team on social media, it will break my little piggy heart. There are so many books, workshops, and groups out there to support you. There's tons of it. Uh, the Manager's Path is my favorite book on management, and I really strongly recommend it. To recap very quickly, managers, you're going to be doing something different. You're going to be supporting and enabling your team. You're not telling them what to do. You're giving them the tools and eliminating the blockers to let them do it. You're going to be working with an entirely different skill set that you need to build and refine. And oh boy, if you're not thinking about ethics, yeah, it's a good time to start thinking about ethics. Thank you so much.